Everyone's heard the story of Galileo's run-in with the Church. After proposing a view of the universe backed by science but contradicting the Bible, the Church declared his work heretical and tortured him, because the Church doesn't like science. Or so the story goes. But what if I told you that this version of history wasn't told until the late 1800s, and that the Church has not only supported science throughout its entire history, it has often been on the forefront of making it better. In our public sphere, science and religion are at odds. On the one hand, there are people like Bill Maher, who believe that religion is the enemy of all things intellectual. I do admit there are things in the universe I don't understand. Okay. But my response to that is not to make up silly stories, <laughs> to believe intellectually embarrassing myths from the Bronze Age, but you believe whatever you want. On the other hand, there are zealous religious leaders who believe that science is a threat to the Bible and faith. Instead of looking for the truth of the Creator, described in His divinely revealed book, science has chosen confusion, suppositions, and deceit, with millions of ministers and parishioners following blindly. As a result, we're left with ridiculous things, like this debate between scientist Bill Nye and Creationist Museum founder Ken Ham, an attempt to once and for all prove who's right, religion or science. Ugh. It's because of things like this that we're constantly told that science and religion are at odds. Scientists should fear religion because of what happened to Galileo, and Christians should fear science because Charles Darwin and the modern scientific movement challenge our faith. But are either of these things true? Yeah, the, the legend of the Galileo affair is much more famous than the facts. <laughs> so the, I mean, the, the facts are, I mean, Galileo got in trouble, right? But um, the legend is it's because of science and religion are in conflict. The reality is that in Galileo's time, there were plenty of scientists on both sides of the question of whether the world was as Copernicus said it was or as Ptolemy said it was, the Earth or Sun at the center of the system. And there wasn't enough evidence at the time to know for sure which was true. At the time, there were a lot of reputable scientists arguing for the other side, and Galileo didn't have sufficient empirical evidence, what science is based on, to actually prove what he was claiming. Some of his evidence was actually kind of laughable today, like the fact that the waves of the ocean were caused by the Earth's rotation. That's just bad science. But what Galileo lacked in scientific proof was nothing compared to what he lacked in tact. He was very brash and aggressive in the way he presented the theory. Uh, he presented it in Italian rather than Latin, and that offended a lot of people. He made the Copernican system, the Ptolemaic system that was favored by a lot of clerics and philosophers and, and scientists, he made them sound like they were just stupid. Um, so he got a lot of people angry, and that's partly what got him into trouble. Taken together, it's no wonder that Galileo was eventually silenced. He presented a new theory for which he did not have sufficient evidence, and when told not to teach things he couldn't prove, he attacked the church, the pope, and even his fellow scientists with smear campaigns. Not exactly a charmer, that Galileo. In 1633, after Galileo ignored the church's cease and desist order, he was brought to trial. But it's important to get the facts straight about this trial. Galileo was not put on trial because his scientific findings contradicted the Bible. According to Robert Bellarmine, saint and doctor in the Catholic Church and one of the most important figures of Galileo's time, the church was open to new findings and he is even well known to have said that if evidence was properly put forth, the church would have to reconsider its interpretation of certain passages of scripture. No, Galileo was actually put on trial because his scientific findings were very unscientific. He was teaching as fact what he could not prove as fact, something that many scientists of his day disagreed with. More importantly, he was teaching as fact what he had promised before a court a decade earlier to no longer teach. This is why Galileo was condemned. But does that really warrant torture on the part of the church? Sure, he was guilty, but that seems a bit extreme. That's an excellent question, if in fact Galileo was ever actually tortured. In reality, he was treated well in his final trial, housed in a luxurious hotel overlooking the Vatican Garden, and assigned a personal valet. When he was eventually convicted, he was given house arrest in a country home near Florence, where his daughter took care of him. It was here, in the comfort and isolation of his final years, that he finally produced the evidence we use today to support his system. So where does the story of Galileo that I was taught in school come from? The legend begins to grow kind of in the early modern era with the Enlightenment and people like Voltaire who want to make the church look as bad as possible, as irrational as possible, uh, to present the church and Christianity as antithetical to reason, to science, to progress. And Galileo became a useful story to make that claim, and he became a kind of martyr for science, which he never was. <laughs> 
While there are many factors that led up to this, this conflict model, as it is called, between religion and science can really be attributed to two men in the 19th century. John William Draper, who wrote History of Conflict Between Religion and Science, and Andrew Dixon White, who wrote A History of the Warfare of Science with Theology and Christendom. It's from these men that we get not only the popular stories of Galileo, but also the myth that people of the Middle Ages believed that the earth was flat, the idea that the church suppressed scientific study and condemned scientists, and that Christianity is a stupid religion that is inherently at odds with science. Anyone who has studied Christianity for a minute knows that these are blatantly untrue statements. Besides the fact that even ancient theologians like Augustine understood the story of Genesis shouldn't be taken literally at the expense of empirical observation, Christians have always been at the forefront of scientific study. We founded universities to study the natural world, formulated the earliest scientific method, and paved the way for modern scientific inquiry. In the modern era, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck proposed a theory of evolution 100 years before Darwin. Gregor Mendel, an Augustinian friar, is regarded as the father of genetics. And the Big Bang Theory? You know, the best explanation we have for the creation of all things in the universe? Yeah, first proposed by Father George Lemaitre, Catholic priest. And they say the church doesn't like science? Seriously? And yet, these books by Draper and White were not only influential in the scientific communities, propagating suspicion towards religion because of stories like Galileo's, they were picked up by conservative and fundamentalist Christians as well. Science was the enemy of religion, a threat to biblical interpretation of faith. Despite the fact that Darwin himself said that his findings were not incompatible with faith in God, some Christians fed into the conflict model and hold it even today. Luckily, this is a very small number of people. Historians in the 1970s outright rejected this view of history, and most of the best scientists of the world admit that there is no inherent conflict between religion and science. Most religious people in America fully embrace science. So the, the argument that religion has some issue with science applies to a small fraction of those who declare that they are religious. They just happen to be a very vocal fraction, and so you get the impression that there's more of them than there actually is. Consider also that in America, 40% of American scientists are religious. So this notion that there's some, um, that if you're a scientist, you're an atheist, or if you're religious, you're not a scientist, that's just empirically false. It's an empirically false statement. But just because most people don't see an inherent conflict between the two, doesn't mean that everyone fully understands how they should be related. In fact, there are three other models for understanding the relationship, two that have pretty obvious flaws, and the one the church professes. The first flawed model is called the concert model. In this way of thinking, science and religion are playing perfectly in sync, all the notes lining up in harmony. If we look hard enough into the world, proponents say, we can find scientific proofs for all the teachings in the Bible. For instance, um... Science tells us that first, that life began in the oceans and then emerged on land. In Genesis, life begins in the ocean and then life appears on the land. That's coincidence, uh, but if you want to have this concert model, you want to have what science tells you and what the Bible tells you agree. So you want all the miracle stories to have scientific explanations or naturalistic explanations. It's a way of just trying to make them completely coherent. The problem, of course, is that they are not completely coherent because they were never meant to be that way. To read scripture as if it were a science textbook, when it was written as poetry or theology, cheapens both scripture and science. And yet, turn on the History Channel right now, and you'll probably find someone trying to explain how they crossed the Red Sea because of the rare climatological occurrences, or how explorers might have found Noah's Ark in a mountain somewhere. Missing the point a bit. As a response to this model, others have gone the opposite direction, proposing what is called the contrast model. Sometimes this contrast model is spoken of as two separate, non-overlapping magisteria. That science does what it does, religion does what it does, and they have nothing really to do with each other. They're not in conflict, they're just not really talking to each other or about the same things. The problem with this model, quite obviously, is that science and religion are often talking about the exact same thing. The creation of the world, what it means to be human, sexuality, ethics. There's no doubt that there is a different way of understanding these things, science being based on pure empiricism and religion incorporating divine revelation, but the content and purpose of their study is often the same. For this reason, we get to the final, most coherent model, the model that the Church has supported for centuries, the correlation model, based on the belief that the triune God is the creator animated of all that exists, 
Catholics have always proposed that everything can reveal something about God, not just divine revelation in Scripture. So in other words, the Church would say, and people have often said, um, truth cannot contradict truth. So if science is a path to truth and revelation is a path to truth, these two in some ways, they cannot contradict. If it seems they contradict, there's some problem in the way you understand the science or some problem in the way you understand revelation. What this model leaves us with, and what the Catholic Church has taught for centuries, is that we need to take to heart what St. Paul wrote in the first letter to the Thessalonians. Test everything, keep what is true. God gave us the ability to reason, to think, to explore, and to dialogue. Why would we want to deny one of the faculties God gave us? It is a grave mistake for us as Christians to view science as anything other than an incredible resource, something that should guide our theological thinking and be guided by what we know about God's creation. That's the way we've always understood it, and the way we always should. Thanks to Dr. David Bosworth for helping with this conversation, as well as for all the work he does to incorporate science into the seminary classroom. Check out the description for a link to this article featuring his work. Also, if you like this segment of Catholicism in Focus, the series that brings clarity to some of the Church's most misunderstood issues, check out these other videos as well. And be sure to subscribe to the Breaking the Habit YouTube channel.